So, uh, we will continue our discussion on the in vitro toxicity and apoptosis of bone cells, particularly we have you, uh, I will show you that you know um, how uh, human fetal osteoblast that HFOB cells uh, can undergo apoptosis due to the treatment by nanoparticles. So, the first question that I will address is that what is genotoxicity and if you know that in the human genome like DNA. So, DNA has a typically double helix structure and this DNA when they are treated uh, when uh, when the is particular cell is treated with nanoparticles then what will happen if then if the particles are very fine then they can be internalized. Internalized means they can be taken up by the cell nucleus and once they are taken up by the cell nucleus then they can preferentially damage the double helix pattern of the DNA. Now, what will happen if the double helix pattern or the individual strands are broken by the nanoparticle treatment? Now, if you go back to that, first let me answer this one. If you remember the DNA structure, uh, which is not very complicated if you understand it in a logical sequence. Now, let me remind you, so this is the strand 1, this is your strand 1 and this is your strand 2 and how these strands are made? Strands are made by phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar molecule and one base. Now, this base can be either A that stands for adenine, T stands for thymine, G stands for guanine and C stands for cytosine. Okay. So, either of these four things can be there. And the <coughs> way this base pairing is typically take place is A T and G C. So, this is the typical base, base pairing like these two bases can come and they form a hydrogen bonds in between. So, you can see this red ones, these are like you know hydrogen bond or weak bond. Okay. Now, A T G C and the, this is the double strand. Now, in order to minimize the total energy of the system typically in the natural state this DNA forms a double helix and this double helix pattern also it is not in arbitrary manner like 10 base pairings each one complete turn of the double helix that requires 10 base pairing at least. So, that means between A and T and G and C at least they, there will be 10 base pairing. So, if you if you continue if you count here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So, that means this is a total one complete turn of the double helix from this one to this one. Now, as I said that if you if you uh, if you treat cells with the very fine particles and they are internalized by cells and suppose they they are breaking this double helix pattern. Breaking means there are certain breaks in the continuity of the this different strands. Okay. Now, these strands can be broken at any arbitrary manner either at this place, this place or any other place. Okay. Now, what will happen if the strands are broken? Because you know that DNA structure typically con typically produces protein via process known as a transcription translation process. What is transcription process? The double helix pattern of the DNA can give rise to RNA inside the nucleus in a eukaryotic cell. RNA further undergo translation process to produce the protein and this is a protein structure where is this is C terminal on the right and this is N terminal on the left of the protein structure. And that is the way that flow takes place genetic information from DNA to RNA to protein in living cells. So, <laughs> this is that you know more view of this uh, protein trans protein trans uh, sorry DNA transcription process like you know you have a single strand here this is a single strand here this can be A, this can be G, this can be A, this can be G or whatever or whatever sequence it can be. Now, this sequence if you see in the DNA you have the ATGC, but you know in, in case of the RNA you have. Uh, so, in DNA you have that ATGC and in case of the RNA that thymine group T is replaced by uracil U. And typically RNA structure is made of the single strand. Okay. 
as you can see that RNA structure is typically made of a single strand not like a double strand as you have seen for DNA. And here you have the cytosine, you have the adenine, you have the uracil and you have the guanine. This is the four bases. Okay? And these bases also can be in, partic in, a, in, a, in a particular order. So, therefore, if you, if you look at the chemical differences between DNA and RNA, the nucleotides in the RNA are essentially ribonucle ribonucleotides because they contain sugar ribose rather than deoxyribose. And then second one is that in terms of bases like uracil replacing the thymine. And third one is that DNA has a double helix strand and whereas RNA has a single strand. So, these are the three important differences between DNA and RNA. Now, if the DNA double strand is and, and this is a particular thing that you know this is a more view of the translational process. Now, this is your double strand DNA which is there inside the nucleus. Okay? Now, it undergoes transcription. Now, how it undergoes transcription? Like you know your single strand here, there it is just being dissociated and it forms a only one single strand that is what is RNA molecule. Okay? Now, there are two th couple of things that requires explanation here. You have the exons and introns. What is the exons? Exons is actually functional unit. Now, which is red in color you see that becomes blue in the case of the RNA, but exactly their expression also is same. Okay? So, exons here what I mean by this is the red one and this is here the blue one. So, that total expression of this exons in the DNA will remain almost similar in case of the RNA also. And introns, introns is enables to protect exons. So, introns, introns is this non red color thing and these introns are typically required in DNA to protect the RNA part of the to protect the exons. Now, once this transcription makes this primary RNA transcript, then what will happen? This RNA will undergo further biochemical processing which is known as the splicing. So, splicing is nothing but that is a biochemical processes which makes primary RNA to mRNA. mRNA stands for messenger RNA. So, there are three types of RNA. That is one is mRNA that is messenger RNA and this is the code for proteins. That means that whatever proteins will have amino acid sequence that code is there inside the messenger RNA or in other, in other way messenger RNA carries the code for the amino acids which will be finally formed outside the nucleus. Okay? There is another RNA called small r RNAs that is called ribosomal RNAs. Now, ribosomal RNAs this forms the basic structure of the ribosome. What is ribosome? Ribosome is the protein synthesis unit which is there in the cytoplasm right outside the nucleus. And there is called T RNAs. T RNAs means this is called transfer RNAs that is central to protein synthesis and this is that between mRNA and amino acid. So, there is three primary RNAs or three important RNAs. One is mRNAs, one is rRNAs and one is the tRNAs. Now, <coughs> what you see in this particular, this is the eukaryotic cells. In the case of eukaryotic cells, your transcription process, everything is completed within the nucleus itself. Okay? So, this is your capital N, this is your capital C, N stands for nucleus, C stands for cytoplasm. Now, translational process that occurs outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm and there the protein is ultimately synthesized. Now, what you see here that in case of that mRNAs, mRNAs have two things. One is the cap, mRNA RNA cap and one is that AAA that is that poly A, poly A tail. Now, why these two things are required in case of the mRNA? RNA cap actually protects RNA capping, RNA capping and then A, A poly A tail, this actually protects the entire RNA molecule from degradation. Now, if there is no capping and if there is no poly, uh, poly A tail, poly, why it is known as poly A tail? Because there are multiple A and that is why it is called poly A tail. Okay. Now, if there is no capping and no tail here, then what will happen? This RNA, mRNA cannot 
come out of the nucleus and they itself will be degraded by certain enzymes inside the nucleus or in other words the a, these mRNA functions will be lost. They will not be able to carry the codes for the proteins for synthesis outside the nucleus. Now, what is the requirement for this RNA cap and poly A tail? RNA cap and poly A tail essentially protect the mRNA molecule. If there is no cap and no tail, then what will happen? This mRNA will be degraded by the attack with from the enzymes inside the nucleus. So, the, this mRNA cannot be synthesized, where the mRNA cannot be protected. Now, what will happen? The final protein that will be synthesized from mRNA via the process called translation that takes place outside the nucleus. So, that takes place in the cytoplasm itself. An entire process of transcription and translation, it is known as the central dogma as I have already mentioned in the last lecture also. Now, in case of the prokaryotic cell, what will happen? You have the DNA and you have that exons here. These red ones are exons. And if when you see that it is the transcription process, this red one ex exons actually transform to completely blue one. And then in the translation process, it goes to the protein synthesis in the eukaryotic prokaryotic cells. So, for example, in bacterial cells, the transcription and translation process both occurs in the cytoplasm because there is no distinct nucleus in the bacterial cells. So, all the DNAs they are like loosely spread out in the cytoplasm. So, therefore, transcription and translation process actually take place in, in the cytoplasm itself. Yeah, this is what I have already mentioned to you that up to the DNA to the mRNA process transcriptional control and RNA processing control, RNA processing control which is known as the splicing. Okay? So, RNA processing control everything takes place inside the nucleus. Now, this mRNA is transported from nucleus to cytoplasm via the nuclear pore. Okay? So, this is the nuclear pore and this once this mRNA is coming out of the nuclear pore, then if it is goes to the RNA translation control, then it goes to the protein and protein activity control. If it goes to the mRNA degradation control, then it becomes inactive mRNA. So, outside the cytoplasm also mRNA can become active or can become inactive depending on whether it is attacked by some hormones or some enzymes and so on. So, if it is not active, then it goes to the inactive mRNA and eventually it will be degraded. And if it is active and it goes to translational control, then it makes the protein with the C terminal at the right and N terminal at the left. Okay? So, and, and also another thing that you know that in that DNA structure, if it is broken at these different junctions, then what will happen? The individual strand, suppose this is S it cannot make S prime because the strand is now broken. So, therefore, DNA replication process or from one DNA to multiple DNA that replication process also cannot take place. Also, it cannot take place is another thing is that DNA to mRNA or DNA to RNA transcription process because your basic structure is now faulted or this basic structure is now broken. So, therefore, this genotoxicity means that is the DNA damage and DNA damage means this material with this DNA can neither form complementary uh, this backbone chains and therefore, that DNA cannot be replicated nor this DNA can produce RNA and further can produce further protein. So, entire transcription translational control also will not be activated because of the faulty structure also that replication process will not be also activated because of the DNA becomes damaged now. So, this is known as the genotoxicity process. Now, you know what is the consequence of the damaged DNA and that once this one of the strand or both the strands are broken at various places, then both the DNA replication and transcription translation process cannot take place in the nucleus or in the eukaryotic cells. 
So, now the question is that how we can prepare this nanoparticles although I have mentioned it very fast in the last lecture. So, let me just refresh your mind. You have the sintered pellets, the sintered pellets means it is a compact of the some powder based material and then if you crush it to make a coarser particles then you can do it that repeated ball milling process here. After repeated ball milling it is ultra fine particles in the DMEM that is a duplicose modified eagles medium that typically culture medium for the uh, pro eukaryotic cells. Then after you do that medium then you can filter it with certain filters let us say 0.22 micron filter or so on. So, that very fine particles can be dispersed in the DMEM. Now, after this you treat this elevate. So, this is the uh, 4 well plate for example. So, 4 well plate means like there are 4 different wells and each well you, you put the cells and then you treat them with the nanoparticles carried by the DMEM. Okay. Now, once you do that then you can do the cytotoxicity assay that is called MTT assay. Then you can do the genotoxicity assay like single cell gel electrophoresis or micronucleus assay and finally, you can do the gene profiling also. So, all those things I will show you that how to carry out in the laboratory scale. Now, <coughs> the other things that I have um, that I would mention here that the as a case study what I will show that hydroxyapatite which is a bioactive material and which is also the inorganic composition of the human tissue or bone. Now, hydroxyapatite as a monolithic material it is very difficult to be used because it is very brittle in nature. So, therefore, what we have developed we have developed H20M stands for hydroxyapatite HA 20 weight percent mullite. Okay. Now, why mullite? Mullite is essentially used to increase the physical properties like strength like fracture toughness of this ceramic materials. Okay. So, that they can be more suited for a long term applications and load bearing applications. Now, once we make this a, so therefore, if, if you start with this one. So, you have to start with that HA 20 moolite. Okay. This is the sintered pellet. Now, from this sintered pellets you crush it, you put it ball milling and then you filter it and then you make that DMEM low. Uh, so, this um, ultra fine particle loaded DMEM solution and this uh, loaded solution then it is treating the uh, human fetal osteoblast cells and this is what two types of particles you can see this is less than 100 nanometer and this is greater than 100 nanometer you can clearly see this is your 500 nanometer bar. So, therefore, individually these particles are like less than 100 nanometer. So, then we do this MTT assay. So, MTT assay essentially what is MTT? MTT is a particularly biochemical reagent okay. and this is the typical structure of the MTT. What you see in the MTT? You have several benzene rings. This is one ring, this is another ring and these rings also there is there is different other bondings here in this case and there are methyl groups are also loaded here. So, this MTT when they are reacting with a live cells then what will happen? This MTT will react preferentially with the mitochondria of the metabolically active cells and then what it will make? It will make the formagen crystals and these formagen crystals they will be violet in color. Okay? So, therefore, the more the number of viable cells are there in the solution, the more intensity of this violet color the solution will give when it will be analyzed by the uh, ELISA microplate reader for the optical density. You understand what I am saying? So, if there are less number of viable cells, this violet color intensity also optical density also will be less. So, from that optical density you can directly say that higher optical density means more number of viable cells are there, less optical density means less number of viable cells there. And this viable means here as I as I have mentioned this is called metabolically active cells. Metabolically active cells means that is mitochondrially active cells that means their mitochondria are 
still active and they are like in the typically the, this mitochondria is still mitochondria is known as the powerhouse of the cell like all this ADP, ATP transformation everything is occurring in the mitochondria. So, that means the mitochondria is active means cells are getting enough energy for its survival. So, that is the basis for the MTT deduction process. Now, this is the MTT results. Now, what you see here MTT results here that you know that there are 10 percent to 100 percent eluate concentration here and this is control. Control means untreated cells. Okay. So, control means untreated human fetal osteoblast cells and this is 10 percent concentration means total in this solution the DMEM loaded solution here it has only 10 percent of the particles and so 10 percent of the particles are loaded here. Now, there are three different time scale this MTT reduction process take place one is 6 hour, one is 24 hours and one is 48 hours that 6 hour, 24 hours, 48 hours from which point it is counted like the moment in a culture medium you treat or you inject the particles, the eluate particles. Then from after that 6 hours you take your MTT values, okay, optical density values. Now, what you see in the 6 hours typically optical density values are re relatively higher. That means most of the cells are now surviving. Now, after, now after 24 hours what you see that this number of cells are decreased for all concentration. Agree with that? Okay. And this is the case for the less than 100 nanometer particle size. This is the case for the greater than 100 nanometer particle size. This is for pure hydroxyapatite and this is for pure moolite. Now, what you see here that this is the less than 100, this is 100, greater than 100 nanometer. So, you, you, you do notice that depending on the treatment time 6 hour or 24 hours, there is a general tendency of decreasing the MTT values with increasing the time duration. Now, if you look at the 48 hour values that means this is the green one and green one also in all the cases the MTT values are less than that of the 24 hour case. So, what it means? It means that the toxicity potential increases with more treatment time or increasing treatment time because from 6 hours to 24 hours to 48 hours your MTT optical density values are progressively decreasing independent of all the concentrations. Okay. Now, in case of greater than 100 nanometer what you see here this kind of progressive decrease you see this decrease, this decrease, this decrease is significantly less here because in all the cases your MTT values is 80 percent or higher. You understand what I am saying? So, that means when you are treating the same solid culture solution with the same cells with the nanoparticles less than 100 nanometer, then the toxicity values are much more compared to that when you are treating with that more than 100 nanometer particle size. Is it clear? In case of the hydroxyapatite, you do not see any toxicity at all because your, your MTT values are at 100 percent or little bit above 100 percent. In case of moolite again your MTT values is decreasing and this decreases is also more or less independent of the concentration of 6 or 24 and 48 hours. So, this is the typical cell morphology after treatment with different concentration of that H20M hydroxyapatite 20 percent moolite of less than 100 nanometer and you can see that morphology also it changes uh, depending on the treatment uh, treatment concentration or treatment time. Now, in case of the L929 if you see this decrease is also significant, okay. but here in case of the L HFOB cells there is some trend which could not be established because 24 hour 
after 24 hour treatment suddenly you see that MTT values is increasing. Whereas, 48 hours this MTT values are decreasing independent of the concentrations. So, we do see there are some trends like if you consider the 12 hour to 48 hour from 12 hour that to 48 hour the MTT values decreases, but we cannot confidently say based on this results that it decreases with increasing time because in the 24 hour case we have seen independent of the concentration that MTT values decreases from 12 hour situations. Okay. <clears throat> the single cell gelatinization which I have already mentioned to you in the last lecture, it is essentially it shows that real time DNA damage. So, this is the control negative control, negative control and this is called positive control. Positive control means that we use some solution when you treat cells with that particular solution, then it will show extensive genotoxicity. Extensive genotoxicity means if you see the DNA fragmentation. So, all these dots essentially it reflects the DNA fragmentation around the nucleus of the cells. In case of the negative control, you do not see any DNA fragmentation okay? and that is what is mentioned uh, that is what you also shown here positive negative and positive control. Now, if you treat them with 5 percent or 10 percent, 20 percent and 50 percent, 100 percent, then what you notice with increasing concentration that your DNA damage capability is also to some extent increases. However, this increase if you compare with this positive control, it is much less. That means that although these hydroxyapatite 20 percent mullite particles, they can uh, they can contribute to the genotoxicity property, but at a much less significant manner compared to the positive control material. So, this is the quantification of the comet assay results. Now, how it is quantified? Normally, with, the, with some software, one can use that olive tail moment. Olive tail moment means that is that quantifies that how much comet shape is distorted and how much DNA has been damaged here and this olive comet olive tail moment when you plot it with concentration what you see that they show the statistically significant values compared to this negative uh, positive negative control as well as the positive control. But olive tail moment values here it is much less than that of the positive control in all the cases. Coming to the fluorescent activated cell sorter, till now you know that what is the toxicity at the cellular level. Now, we would like to know that after you treat the cells with the hydroxyapatite mullite solution, that what is the fraction of the treated cells, they are in the apoptotic stage or they are in the necrotic stage or they are in the late apoptotic stage or they are live cells. What is the difference between apoptotic and vital cells? Vital means viable cells. Okay. So, these are cells are live, these are cells are apoptotic. Now, this, this is the typically typical structure of the plasma membrane, which is a double layer kind of a structure. So, this is the top layer, which is exposed to ECM here, extracellular matrix. This is the bottom layer, which is exposed to cytoplasm C. Okay. Now, in this double layer structure, there are certain molecules which is known as phosphatidylserine. Phosphatidylserine. Now, these molecules, phosphatidylserine, so this is called known as the PS molecule. Now, these PS molecules, they are actually appearing here is a colored molecules here, okay, in this slide. Now, when it is a live cells or vital cells, this phosphatidyl serine molecules, they are exposed to the cytoplasm or bottom side or inner leaflet. When the cell is apoptotic, then what will happen? There is asymmetry of the plasma membrane structure. Asymmetry means some of the phosphatidyl serine molecule will now be exposed to the extracellular matrix in the outer leaflet. Okay? But in the live cells, all the phosphatidyl serine molecules, they are exposed to the cytoplasm only. Now, 
once they are exposed to the extracellular matrix, uh, extracellular matrix, now there is a dye called annexin 5. It is like another dye like you know MTT type of dye. Now, this annexin 5, they can be clapped together with this phosphatidyl serine residue and as a result, what will happen that the more the annexin 5 molecules are being reactive with this phosphatidyl serine molecules, what it will indicate? It will indicate that more number of cells are in the apoptosis stage. Is it clear? So, if the annexin 5 dye molecule shows the positive response, I repeat, if the annexin 5 dye molecule shows the positive response, what it means? The cells are in the apoptosis stage. This is the called positive response. If the annexin 5 molecules shows the negative response, what it means? The cells are now live cells or cells are vital cells. Now, there are another molecules which is known as that PI that is propidium iodide. Now, propidium iodide typically interacts with DNA and causing red fluorescence of the necrotic cells. Now, this is you have seen about that this annexin 5 treatment, it directly reacts with the plasma membrane outer leaflet. Now, there is another molecules which is known as propidium iodide, what it does? It goes through the cytoplasm, then it goes to the nucleus, it reacts with the DNA of the nucleus and then if the cells are necrotic, then propidium iodide will make red colored nucleus. Okay? Now, if the nucleus is becomes red after this propidium iodide treatment, then what will happen? Then then you can say that these many cells are in the necrosis stage. Okay? So, there are two ways we are detecting one is that annexin 5 and another one is the PI. Okay? Now, if that annexin 5 is also positive, PI is also positive, then certainly the cells are not viable at all, cells are all dead. Okay? If the PI is negative, Annexin 5 is negative, cells are live cells, they are vital cells. Okay? So, now you can follow this slide very easily. First one I have written annexin 5 is negative, annexin 5 is negative, PI is negative, cells are live cells are vital cells. Now, I said that annexin 5 is negative and PI is positive, PI is positive means cells are going towards a necrosis stage, but not yet all the cells are necrosis. We call it as late apoptotic cells. Okay? If annexin 5 is positive, that means cells are apoptotic, PI is positive, that means cells are already dead, then we call them necrotic cells. Okay? If annexin 5 is positive and PI is negative, that means cells are early apoptotic cells. If we go back to this one, then it is what I said, I said if both the annexin 5 and PI are negative, then cells are live cells, no confusion at all. If annexin 5 is negative, PI is positive, that means cells are going through the early apoptotic stage. If annexin 5 is positive, PI is negative, then cells are going to the late apoptotic stage. Annexin 5 is negative, PI is positive, then it is called late apoptotic stage. And if annexin both are positive, both are positive means like annexin 5 is positive and PI is also positive, then cells are necrotic, necrotic cells. Now, how you can determine this using that facts? You send through that cell suspension which are treated with hydroxyapatite molite. And then what will happen? You allow them to go through a particular stream jet like a pattern here, where you also apply certain voltage externally like 2, two kilo volt voltage difference, 2000 volt, 2 kilo volt. Now, here you are, you are putting this laser light and their detectors 
and analyzers. So, these detectors and analyzer and this laser system, they are you are actually allowing the quantification to take place and depending on whether the cells will finally carry positive charge or negative charge and how they are stained with this annexin 5 and the PI from that it can be sorted. So, fluorescence activated means this annexin 5 is a fluoromolecule, PI propidum iodide is also fluoromolecule. So, when you treat the cells with annexin 5 and propidum iodide, they will respond differently depending on whether the cells are in the live cells, apoptotic cells or necrotic cells. Okay? And from the color difference through this laser light, you can essentially detect how much color is red, how much color is different color with the annexin 5 staining. And from the stained cells, each of the cells can be monitored via this analyzer and then you can quantify that how much cells are live cells, how much cells are early apoptotic, late apoptotic or necrotic cells. So, that is what has been mentioned here that fax actually uses the emission signals from each cell to sort the cell into one or two sample collection tubes and a waste reservoir. If specific coordinates are set to delineate sections of the display, specific coordinates means you tell, you tell the system that the test tube which is placed at this 45 degree angle plus 45 degree or neg minus 45 degree angle that will be vital cells which is no, which is in the minus 45 degree they are necrotic cells and similarly all other type of cells you can essentially mention. And then system will tell will guide in such a way that you know exactly vital cells will be going to the plus 45 degree test tube, my ne necrotic cells will go to minus 45 degree test tube and so on. And therefore, you can actually collect the cells which is vital, which is necrotic, which is late apoptotic. So, cell sorter means depending on whether the cells are live or necrotic, this machine will be able to sort the cells or will be able to distribute or distinguish the cells depending on whether it is vital or apoptotic cells. And this is one of the most powerful cell separation techniques. Cell separation means it distinguishes cell depending on whether there is antibody coupled to a fluorescent dye to label specific cells which are to be separated from the unlabeled ones. So, this is your unlabeled cells and this is your labeled cells. And what is antibody? Antibody is typically another protein and then it has a typically N end here and C end here. As you can see, this is that one type of protein molecule, this is another type of protein molecule. So, it has a typically complicated structure. 